The protein did not come out easy, it's actually growing pretty fast now. And we are at the point that we can design protein structures. The, the challenge is now people are facing is to design the proteins with the embedded functions. Like if you want to de design enzyme to do the enzymatic thing, like to cut peptide bond or to stage peptide together, if you want to design that, that's hard, that's real hard. Because protein function, when protein function is a dynamic process, it's not like a solid rock, right? It's not just sit there and do nothing. It actually moves around and do things. So how you design this dynamic thing, it's really hard. To be able to develop that kind of therapeutics, you can't get away from making the mirror image protein molecules. If you want to make that, how do you make that? You need new technologies. That's what we are doing. For us, we will collaborate with the people like Life Science School of Life Science at Western University and other people too, other people too. And we will see like which molecule, which target is the most relevant, like therapeutic target, or it's the most like medically unmet mm. like needs for the patients. We focus, we identify that first, and then we use all the approaches we have. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we, and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about protein technologies. We have Dr. Bobo Dong joining us on the show. Hi, Bobo. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Really appreciate it. I'm glad. I'm so excited to have you. For those who don't know Bobo's background, he's an assistant professor and principal investigator at Westlake University, focused on protein synthesis and engineering. And you can find his links in the bio below. Okay, Bobo, let's start things off by asking you one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Yeah, I mean, the world is moving forward for sure. And then I think, I think the meaning of the world is just like, it needs to provide opportunity for every single human being to explore the unknown nature of like science, maybe territory to the unknown world. But then to do that, you have to have a like healthy lifespan to, to, to enable yourself to do that. Like for example, myself, if I got an injury, I can't go out and do things, right? So we do have the, maybe the health system or maybe the technologies to enable the society can ensure or provide the like stage for everybody to do that. And then for us, like working in the like protein science or like health biotechnologies or pharma pharmacologies like and other things, we are the people to do that, like to to come up with strategies or like different ways like to repair people, to treat people when they really they don't have like a healthy body. So I think I'll be dedicating my career to like, to this goal, like to people who wants to explore the world and then to make sure like these people are like in the healthy states and then they can do that. I think, I think that will be my end goal actually. So how to do that? How to do that? Of course, there are different ways. Like we take different approaches. Like you can either develop like technologies, like, like surgeon, they do surgeries, right? They, 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 do, they fix people. And then people like me, like we develop like protein therapeutics, which is like the leading like technology in the 21st century, like to, to treat patients, like to fight cancer, to like and other diseases. So I'll be working on that too. Yeah, there's two thoughts there. One of them is increasing the basic needs for everyone around the world to be able to actualize their unique gift and potential. I love that. And then the other one is the, the ability to be able to make targeted therapeutics for tackling some of the biggest complex diseases that we have to prevent pathologies from developing in the first place, to stay healthy longer so we can be more creative, pass more time with our families, find more meaning, all this kind of cool stuff. Yeah. How about your journey? 
Who were you as a kid growing up? How did you get interested in science and proteins? Yeah, I think for me myself, I think it's all, it's always about like curiosity. Like, like growing up, I think I'm pretty curious about like different things. Like, I mean, I go out in the field, I look at things. Like, I wonder why pe what what thing why birds fly. Like, why something you can see the color like the firefly, right? How does it work? I mean, I'm always curious about these things. Like. I mean, I go to a school, of course, I love science, and then I do pretty good on science too. And then especially I was attracted to chemistry, so that's what I love the most. And uh, like, pretty much since, since like undergrad, I took the chemistry at my major. And then in undergrad, I think I developed interest, you know, like, especially in peptides and proteins, because, I mean, these are the things that made up the human body. Like, made up like pretty much the living living world so i was really into these things and trying to figure out how these things work and then maybe we, if we can if people can do something with that like some interesting things maybe at that time i i, was, I wasn't really sure like what i can what i can contribute to this like proteins are so big like if you can how do you like make therapeutics using protein molecules how do you like even manipulate things like Maybe, maybe you know, like create life like doesn't exist in the world. I mean, back then I wasn't sure, right? But then gradually I developed the interest, and then I tried to study more and more. Like after my undergrad, <clears throat> I felt I really love protein, so I I want to make protein molecules, just like the like, organic chemists they make like small molecules, right? So I went to Chicago and joined the Steve Kent lab. Okay, right before we get to Chicago. Yeah. Okay, so I love this young Bobo that I'm envisioning right now that's constantly going and finding the why is it birds fly? Why is it that this is this way, that is that way? How do I you know, ask these questions so you can understand the reality that you were in? And then it was this, this understanding that, you know, if maybe if you can understand proteins, which proteins make up, is it all of life's functioning most of it most, most of life's of it. functioning right that's so interesting and so we'll, we'll be breaking that down and so then you that was kind of a big like ultimate why is like you know why is that and then how can i be an engineer in that space of proteins mm -hmm. okay i like that and then um now uh yeah so then okay after doing um nanjing university was where you did your bachelor's then you decided to move this is a big move to the University of Chicago. So I want you to explain to us. Um, you were there until you did your PhD in chemistry there, um, and we'll talk about what you were doing. But first, let's talk about how did you decide to move to the United States? And also, what was it like when you first arrived? Yeah, I think the nature of myself is just like, I like to explore things. Like, I mean, I, could, I like to go out in nature and explore like things too like for the science aspect it's the same like i was i mean i was studying in china but like it's it's not too much advanced back then i think the leading the leading the leading force is still in the u.s so i i wanted to go to the u.s and see what's up there and just see like if i find like things getting more interesting or not so i decided to go to the u.s and then it also fits my personal interest because i like to explore different things i want to see the world right and see like what are other people doing, what are other cultures like. So I went to the US and then <clears throat> I joined the lab. The lab was actually really good because the the PR was like was really like close to people. So and then like it's the PR also doesn't like really tell people what to do. So you are just like it's just like you have a lab and then you explore yourself to do to see what what, what you are interested in and then decide what to do. And when I first uh, got, in, got to the U.S., so the lab was actually really good. Apart from the lab, like in, the, in, the, in my personal life, it, it was a little bit difficult, I will say, because my English was not this good back then. I can't really quite talk to people like all the time. So that took me some time. So I tried to, I mean, I just, I like to go out and talk to people and then have fun with people. So that's how I trying to like merge into the society and merge like make, just making your friends and then and then grow like gradually see like gradually like 
developing you know, like like relationships with the different people and then eventually with the society and I feel like I'm I'm actually pretty comfortable in there yeah because yeah, like the, the US I think in the spirit of many US like in the spirit of the of the nation like they actually go explore the world I think that's actually rooted in the US I like that too so I'm like the same so I like yeah. that and I, I mean, I like the life, personal life, I like that too. So it's actually a perfect fit for me. Yes, yes. And then when you're <laughs> there, what does this mean? Protein ion channel lig ligands. Oh, right. Yeah, so that's a... <laughs> that's a mouthful. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are many things in there. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I can actually give you some introduction. Let's do the introduction first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of okay. some animals. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're all familiar with like animals like spiders, scorpions, right? And these are like, I mean, we see them all the time. And then we know they're dangerous. Because mm. if you got beaten or if you got stung by these things, you got hurt. Some people get killed by those things. Mm. But what really happens for these things is that these animals, they make some like pretty small protein molecules. And these molecules, they can actually interact with the like ion channels, which are memory proteins on your cell. So this protein, when, when, when the animal bite you or stun you, they inject these like little like missiles into your body. Whoa. And these small proteins go out and find these like ion channels. And then they either block the ion channels, then you cannot feel anything. So you, so you, you become numb. Whoa. Some of them become really, like really nasty. Like they stop, they block the ion channel, they modulate the function eventually like people might lose the, lose the hand or lose the legs. So those are actually like really interesting molecules. They, 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 could, they could be really dangerous. But because the, these molecules, they function against these like ion channels or like other cell membrane receptors. So they were actually harvested by like scientists to study these like receptors or ion channels. Yeah. Because traditionally, you don't have any ways to study those, right? Mm -hmm. Only when you have a tool to like change the function or alter the function of these proteins, you can study them. So people have been like actually trying to make these molecules or even like isolate them and then try to probe how these like different ion channel work. And then like, I mean, until today, people are doing that. And these things, because they, they function against these like receptors, they, they can actually be developed as like therapeutics. And there's one chronotoxin, I think. It's like an analgesia, analgesic agent. Like people use that to treat pain. Like up until today, actually, there are like a big group of people, like including many pharmaceutical companies, they are trying to develop like, like molecules, including like small molecules, also these kind of small protein molecules to target the specific like the sodium channels to treat pain. And it's like, there are some, I think there are some clinical trials going on. And I expect there will be, there will, there will be future therapeutic for that. Damn, so <clears throat> there's, bi biology evolved a uh, snakes, scorpions, spiders. All those stuff. To have, some of them have a. Most of them have it. Most of them have. Most this, of them has it. Yeah. A, a, a protein molecule that many different ones. That the many different ones, not yeah. just one across not just them. One. They're just yeah. wow, and and uh, and it's so it evolved so that they themselves could um, once they bit a mammal like yeah. a, like a rodent like a like a rat or like a something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that it works against all mammals, I guess. It works against all potential mammals. Yeah. And then as soon as it bite, then that would paralyze it or something along those lines yeah. and then they could then eat it. Uh, and whoa. So, okay, so then we have the potential to take that out of the creature and then begin doing tests on exactly where, how that um, causes the harm to us. Mm -hmm. And then we can then um, uh, engineer strategies to prevent that from uh, yeah. working. And so I do believe there was another uh, company that at Indie Bio that I was um, helping as well in one of the batches, um, Venomics, that was doing some 
uh, interesting assisting for people, especially in parts of the world that have these venomous uh, creatures, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to uh, prevent them from getting the, the venom uh, uh, issues mm -hmm. arise. Yeah. And I think that's, that's because there's, there's, I believe it was in the millions of people worldwide because there's all different types of venomous. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, okay, then it was, um, this is great. You came to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. To UCSF for his postdoc. Yeah. So he came over to Silicon Valley and that was for four years doing computational protein design for new protein structures. Yeah. Okay, so teach us about this. So also like com computers are now able to do protein design. It's yeah. So it's yeah. so cool. So after I did my PhD, I learned like all the technologies of protein molecules, right? It, there's, there's just like, you can name a protein, I can synthesize it. Any, um, any? Maybe not any, but most of them. Most of them. Yeah, so I got the technology to synthesize many of the proteins, right? And how many they, proteins <coughs> are I synthesized, there? are there? Or? How, yeah, are there, yeah. How so many? in human body, there are about 20,000 genes that encode like 20,000 proteins it's in human body. Is it a one-to-one -one ratio? Uh, the genes means like open reading frames means one gene to one protein. About, yeah, but some yeah, of the pro yeah. in different cells, like some of the protein got expressed, other proteins may not be expressed. But in total, people have these many proteins that, that could be expressed in the human body. But each, each specific cell, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, yeah, but total amount is that. And maybe even before we do the mm. um, computational protein design, yeah. we, we're starting to venture into this, and I think it would be helpful to to also like break this down a little bit more. So, um, okay, people are pretty familiar with at least they understand DNA. Most people at least get the DNA, yeah. and then we have the nucleotides in yeah. the DNA, A's, T's, C's, and G's. Yeah. And then this acts as a code within us that can then be used to make amino acids, which then make proteins. And amino acids are in chains. Right. And those amino acids then fold into the proteins. proteins. Okay, and the body is all all there's like never so there's literally never a moment your whole life your body's constantly reading these letters of dna uh making amino acids putting them into chains make having those fold into proteins to do things for yeah. you yeah. all the time all the time every minute every second every of your second life. yeah it just keeps going like i mean protein are the eventually the functional functional players are like all human activities Let's so, list, yeah, list some of these functional activities that proteins do with the human body. Yeah, right. Like, like the ion channels we just talked about. Like when the neuron, we have the like when I move my hand, right? Yeah. The new, the, your brain needs to send a signal to my muscle, to the muscle, and then the muscle receive the signal. Then, like my hand can move, I can see you. These all function like at the protein level. Like in the neurons, there are like these ion channels, and when you give a stimulus of the ion channel, the ion channel opens and then it gives you like, like a electronic signal. And this electronic signal passed down through the, through the neurons, through the axons, and then eventually pass to your, to, to your muscles and then like your muscle can move. So proteins are a <clears throat> massive part of our nervous system. They're in For sure. every single one of our cells, of, of our yeah. brain cells. Of course, every cell. Yeah, every cell in our body has, every how cell. many proteins are in every cell of our body? Like thousands of proteins? More, of course, more. More than thousands of proteins in every cell. More, I think more than millions. Oh my God. I'm not sure like how yeah. many, but it, it's, it's full of like, it's full of proteins. Like if you think about, if you think about a cup of, cup of water, right? The, the water filled up the cup and then, it's all with like these water molecules in the cell. It's like similar situation. Whoa! So all these different proteins they pretty much filled up your like the cell, your cell. Yeah. So a, so a filled <clears throat> up cup of water has H two O molecules just all around. Yeah, yeah. And then the cell also has filled 
with filled. different it's, biological components right. just filled in it's it. It's all filled up. All it's filled not, up. It's not like no. em, there are empty space here, like a room. The room, yeah, the room has empty, some, like, yeah. You get some empty space yeah. in the cell. There's no empty space. Technically, this is also like I mean, oxygen, air, air, right? right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So technically, there is no empty space. There is no empty space. Wow. I mean, yeah, yeah. If you think of us like ma like proteins, yeah. If you think of this room uh, like a cell, right? Yeah, yeah. And us like these cameras, there's being protein molecules. It will not be this situation in the in the cell. It'd be it will all be filled up. Yeah, it will be filled up like you and me and this desk and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, interact with each other all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is interesting. So, the just like there's an encoded sequences in our DNA to then make the amino acids, which again, there are encoded sequences of amino acids, which make specific proteins. There's somehow proteins are smart themselves. And then the cell is smart itself. People think, okay, well, it makes yeah. sense that a cell is smart. At least, you know, it, 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 that, that one, we've had um, some episodes where we've talked about the intelligence of the cells. But, so, yeah. but the protein inside the cell is intelligent. It knows yeah. what's happening in the cell outside. Like, yeah, I don't, I mean, this, if you really think hard, and then if you really think deep, it goes to, maybe it goes to back the origin of life, right? How that life got evolved? How that life become possible? Like, all these protein molecules, it got, I mean, from evolution, it's, it, it's all get evolved to like up until today but then like how they start in the beginning i'm not sure if people know that yeah. like it starts in the beginning there's only these like atoms molecules like there's no life there's maybe there's no there's no proteins and mm -hmm. then somehow it got it gets evolved and then like bonds make bonds and then you, you come up with these like small maybe smaller segments and then somehow these kind of smaller segments assemble together and then at one point you form cell but then how why why things work like this like how did protein got evolved like to have this function like now we have like so many proteins have so many different functions but why why i don't know i don't know i don't know if we can come up with a solution to that how we but ended up with <coughs> twenty thousand like, of them. yeah how we, or even like how we end up being like what we are yeah yeah I, I don't know i don't know about i don't know how to figure that out but like i mean people have been doing research like to see like how the simple things become like complicated Complex things, things. there's lots of people working on the s simplicity evolving to complexity and yeah. simulating that process yeah which is so fascinating yeah and then we ourselves could potentially launch another uh, mm -hmm. simplicity again and watch yeah. it evolve and trillions of them just watch them evolve you know yeah. it's, it's such a beautiful beautiful creation yeah I don't, maybe yeah if we understand enough of this system right if if eventually if eventually we can understand the system maybe like you have isolated box you give the basic elements and then you fit the information that you know that you learned from all the system maybe in this isolated box we can evolve a life form That'd be so cool, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, now that's a, that's far away from the topic. This is it's, <laughs> oh, it's right there with the biology and evolution, <clears throat> and how proteins were. So so now, how 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 did we? Uh, let's let's also let's also hit this one along the way. How did we figure out the individual components of the cell? as well how many years ago was that ah uh, that started a long time ago 50 years ago more than 50 more than 50. 100 100 yeah must be 100 and and i'm not a cell biologist like i can't i can't tell you two specific things on that but it's been a long time and, and i mean then, it seemed like yeah 50 60 years ago people figured out the dna code exactly francis yes. and Crick. yes but before that people know there are like People know there are DNA, there are proteins. People they, knew there was... There are DNA, I mean, people can isolate, isolate DNA and proteins, but they just don't know how it works. It's understanding the mechanism is different than knowing the molecule exists, right? Oh, so we <coughs> figured out the molecule existed. We knew that for a while, but we didn't know how the mechanism worked. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, Francis the Crick, they solved the DNA structure. That's yeah. how we know how DNA, exactly. how, 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 yeah. how DNA works. But yeah. before that, I mean, people have isolated DNA, so otherwise they can't have the DNA to get the structures. So that goes now, now, now back. Yeah. yeah. And then, so then most recently then, we figured out that, that proteins in a sense are kind of like building blocks. There, there are different proteins that, can, that do different things within our bodies that are critical to the functioning of life. And then, then there's launching the computational capacities now of silicon and chips to be <laughs> able to to do Design. to designs yeah okay so is this mean like there's like a natural biological does like there's 20,000 protein designs that uh for 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 all of biology or for just humans no, for human it's twenty thousand, but other lives, maybe maybe bacteria, they have different number of proteins. Bacteria have different. different yeah, because numbers, that's yeah. where we that's where we find CRISPR, Cas nine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can still find really cool things in like bacteria. So oh, bacteria, for sure. bacteria for sure. might have maybe more like tens of thousands more. You think? I mean, the, some of the protein will be similar. similar they might be yeah, homologous, yeah. but there are different ones. I mean, many of the like all technology were actually like intrigued or like partially contributed by these algorithms like the PCR reaction, the DNA polymerase, the enzyme that the, 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 the real PC, the real DNA polymerase that make PCR work were, were isolated from I think Archaeus. Mm. It's not from human. human, human polymerase doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, and then, then now there's a natural, let's say, in both microbial plus human, right, etc., um, more evolved life, uh, or earlier life, and latter evolved life. There's an array of proteins that exist. And then there's ones that we make that are not found in right. biology. Right. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, because, like, for to make the, like, the truly normal one that's not found in nature. I mean, it's possible to do that now at this moment because we have the computational power to design proteins, like to design the structures that we want. Like if you have a protein structure that you want to design using pure computational approaches, you can do that now. It's totally possible. And you were doing this at UCSF. We did that at UCSF for molecule. Like we designed a protein molecule that has an unnatural component to the protein. We designed that to have the unnatural component. And then after we did the design, we actually did, we actually did the experiment to validate if the design was su successful or not. So eventually we determined the structure and turned out to be like pretty much the same as we designed. So the protein design community is actually growing pretty fast now. And we are at the point that we can design protein structures. Like if you want to do a design structure, we can do that. But the problem, the, the, the challenges now people are facing is to design the proteins with the embedded functions. Like if you want to de design enzyme to do the enzymatic thing, like to cut peptide bond or to stage peptide together, if you want to design that, that's hard. That's real hard. Because protein function, when protein function, it's a dynamic process. It's not like a solid rock, right? It's not just sit there and do nothing. It actually moves around and do things. But how you design this dynamic thing, it's really hard. But that's the, that's the thing the scientists are doing at this moment. So, okay, so then you got your understandings of computational protein design and chemical synthesis. You got your footing in those. And then you were like, okay, I'm going to <clears throat> take this opportunity to come to Westlake. Right. Okay, so now tell us about the transition to Westlake. How did that come up um, after the postdoc and why did you take the opportunity and what are you guys doing now in the lab? Yeah, so we had to go do postdocs. At some point you realize you have too many ideas. To the point that you just have too many ideas, you, you can't work on the, 
work on every single one of them, right? At that point, you know, maybe it's time to move on. Maybe it's time to just start your own lab and get people and work on those things, right? So that's pretty much how I felt when I was uh, finishing up my postdoc and looking for academic jobs. And then for me, I felt, I mean, the reason why I go back to China is, one thing is because I'm Chinese, I grew up in here. I like the things here. I mean, I like the US too, but uh, I thought eventually I probably will move back to China. So that's one reason. Then another reason is like, China is investing a lot in science yeah. to attract like global talents, not just Chinese, like across all nations. Oh, yeah. So I saw the opportunity, so I took it. <laughs> and I thought with the resources we have here, I will be able to do the things that I want to do. So at Westlake, my research group has a few different components. One will be like on the protein, chemical protein synthesis part. Because there are, I mean, people have been working on this for like a, about a century. All the way back from like inefficient make the dipeptide bond to like oxytocin synthesis to like solid phase peptides and then native chemicalization to make proteins. But at this moment, it's still hard to make, it's still hard, challenging to make real protein molecules that's like a big size. Like the biggest one we made up until today is like, less than 400 amino acids long. The peptide chain, less than 400 amino acids. That what took years to do. Okay, we, 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 <coughs> we, let explain this to you. Um, is, a, is a peptide in an amino acid, an amino acid is a peptide? No, a peptide is a, is a chain, chain of amino acids. Okay, so, yeah. so, so, a pe so a peptide is a chain of amino acids, and you, you were giving this example earlier where it's hard to make a, synthesize a protein that can cut no, to, a peptide no to to make a protein that's like 400 I mean, no, that's, that's, now, that, right? that's now i thought yeah. i was mentioning earlier yeah. but okay yes yes so r currently mm -hmm. most of the proteins that are made by our bodies are mm -hmm. made with amino acid chains mm -hmm. peptide chains mm -hmm. of 200, 300? No, so the, if you think about, so proteins could, some proteins they have just one function domain, which means just one thing, and they function. So that size will be around maybe 200, 300 amino acids. If they have one function? If they have one functional domain. Okay. Some proteins, they have a bunch of these things. Whoa. So they become really big. Yeah. Like the our channels we talked about. Yeah. It's over a thousand amino acids now. Like the DNA polymerase we talked about, the people using the lab for PCR, it's over a thousand amino acids now. Wow. I mean, those are, those are the things that beyond, beyond the technology we have at this moment. But we are <coughs> synthesizing two, three hundred... We are, yeah. ...chain amino acids, uh, and, and they're folding into proteins. Yeah, uh, they will with, fold into proteins. With high efficiency right now with high efficiency right but it still takes time like if you want to synthesize a protein of like 300 amino acids it's not the thing that you can do in a week or a month it probably take a year or even longer to do it, it takes a year yeah why it's just like i mean it's just like you need to i mean when you think about protein synthesis you are starting from the individual components you start with one amino acid, you do the second, you do the third, you make a peptide chain, which may be like now 50 amino acids long, but that's not big enough, right? Proteins are like 200, 300. Yeah. You're only making like 50, 40. Yeah. So the, 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 the technology to do that is just you make the bunch of them and you make the individual pieces, right? You can, we can't, can we computationally make those? Can I like assign a robot to make that? We have robots. Yes, we have robots. I mean, we got the robot here. They make the chains for you. But then you need to stitch the chains together. Oh, there's no... Humans still have to stitch the chains? Yeah, yeah. we have to do the reactions and then doing the purifications. Why can't robots do the ch stitch the chains and do the purifications? Right, we haven't... I mean, we do or not. We just don't have it. Like, we pick, don't have one yet that we stitches? We don't have one yet. Like there are, there are things, there are things you need to think about when you do this chemistry. It's all chemistry, but you need to think about how to do this chemistry. It requires a lot of engineering. I think it will come up. 
Yeah. Yeah. I might spend some time on that. That's an interesting one. Yeah. But uh, I mean, but there are there are other ways to go around that. Okay. Yeah. And like how to how do you efficient how to efficiently make the proteins like yeah. a big size beyond three hundred amino acids. And you have to stitch the peptide chain so they actually they actually make the natural natural bonds. Natural bonds. Right. How do they bond? How do the peptide chains bond? With so them? it's it's an amide bond. It's an amide bond between peptide. But the, the, the reaction we do now it's actually invented by my PhD advisor. So we call it native chemical ligation. Native chemical so ligation. right, you have a you have one amino acid on the N terminus, which is we call cysteine. The other side you have a we call thioester. So you just dissolve them together in water. And then they, they, they just come together. Wow. That's it. Pretty simple. But how do you, if you want to have like several eight pieces of all those things stitching together, there are a lot of things. It, it becomes complicated. complicated yeah. yeah, so that's yeah. why it takes time. And that's, that was for one protein <coughs> now, okay? One. Yeah, okay. right. Okay, so and now we, we want um, proteins that have like a thousand amino acids because they do like five or they do more things yeah there are like like for example in this the, in this community people are trying to synthesize the mirror image version of the proteins like why we do that one thing is that if you want if you make the mirror image versions maybe you can explore maybe the just a different universe of life i mean people from Tsinghua university they did they did excellent work on that and more, there are more people I believe are working on that too. Like eventually, if you can make, if you chemically synthesize these mirror image proteins, even like creating a mirror image life, I don't know, I don't know how relevant that is to the thing we are doing now. But I, th I thought it's really cool. Yes. If you come up with that, you, maybe you can see how that interacts with like the natural things. Yeah. That would be pretty. That'd be pretty fun, I think. Yeah. Another reason is there's one direction people are doing is we try to make mirror image protein therapeutics, which is totally unnatural. Like the human human body never saw that. We're trying to make a protein the human body's never see, seen never seen and, and use it and as use a therapeutic. That as a therapeutic, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's like, um, <laughs> you know, uh, okay. I mean, they're, longitudinal they're, testing. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, they might just, just to go into the body and do the thing and then just uh, don't cause anything. But we have to make sure it does the thing. Of course. Of course. You, you of yeah. course need to do, go through like a early development and then doing some animal studies. Yeah. Eventually maybe doing clinical trials and people, including like my PhD advisor, they, they, they've done some other work. But it's still, it's still going up this field. Is there a chemical that's is there a, is there a protein that's been chemically synthesized that is already being used in the FDA? No, not yet. This is like a new thing. This is a re really new. Wow, that will be very profound for the first one that gets approved. Yeah, it will be really, it will be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So. If you think about that, if you want to develop that kind of protein therapeutics, you have to, it gets a little bit complicated. You have to actually make the mirror image version of the natural proteins to do that. I can't explain two details, but it's actually a requirement. You need to make the natural protein target at the mirror image version to, for you, for, to be able to develop that kind of therapeutics. So you can't get away from making the mirror image protein molecules. If you want to make that, how do you make that? You need new technologies. That's what we are doing. Mm. And um, <clears throat> so, so then is it that even the, um, the, the, the chemically uh, synthesized protein would still need to have uh, the mirror image of the one that's inside of our body because it would need to potentially do the effect it wants to do through that protein yeah so so the mirror image therapeutic we eventually come up with right it will inter interact interact with people so they will interact with the natural things yeah yeah, yeah. 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 okay yeah how does your lab figure out 
what proteins it wants to chemically synthesize. There's obviously so un- maybe. unlimited options. So yeah. what do you, how do you guys figure this out? Yeah, so we have to work with the biologist. Like that's also the reason why I joined the School of Life Sciences at West Lake Universities. So most of the like for most of the therapeutic developments, I think the biology, most of the time the biology goes first. Like I mean especially for the targeted approaches, you have one, you need to develop the, maybe a signaling pathway, like, or like a therapeutic target. You have the target, right? And then you try to develop molecules to work on the target, like targeted therapeutics, like now like immune checkpoint inhibitors, like those are focused on the specific target. So you have, you have this target, and then maybe you work on this target. For us, we will collaborate with the people at the life science, like life science school, life science at Western University, and other people too. Other people too, and we will see like which molecule, which target is the most relevant, like therapeutic target, or it's the most like medically unmet, mm. like needs for the patients. We, focus, we identify that first, and then we use all the approaches we have. Do you have any ideas what those targets might be? I mean, our channels is a big one, for sure. Ion channels. Yeah, our channels yeah. is a big one. I've been working on channels like for yeah. a long time. So, our channels, obviously, like pain management is only one thing, epilepsy, other things too. Okay, ion <coughs> channels related to pain management, epilepsy. A lot of things. And like autoimmune disease, a lot, lots disease. of things related to ion channels. Like in immune cells, there are ion channels, there are ion channels too regulating the immune cell okay, activities. Okay, so 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 uh, chemical protein synthesis could be used for immunotherapy. They, well, I can develop the molecules that's used for immunotherapy. Because for immunotherapy now, for the immune checkpoints, it's antibodies. Antibodies are attract the most attention. But I mean, there are other ways too, like to go around antibodies. And I think like this, the current situation with antibodies is just, it's too hot. Like everybody's working on antibodies. I mean, of course it's great. So many drugs, so many antibodies have been like approved. But I think people also need to focus on other classes of protein molecules to co- try to come up with different ways to treat the disease, right? If everybody's working on this one thing, like, Eventually, I don't think it can fix anything. So, I mean, disease, cancer, it's all, it's all a complicated process. You have to have multiple ways or multiple strategies to come up with one thing, with, yeah. to come up with this and then, and then come up with strategies to treat the disease. So I don't think, I think people need to brought out. Yeah. So, let, so then let's talk about then the tools. So then let's say that you identify your ideal targets, mm-hmm. then you come with your suite of tools. Right. What's in the suite of mm-hmm. tools? Yeah, so now there are, th- there are different approaches. We can do these approaches all in our lab. See if you have a target. You can do computational design actually to design the protein molecules. To, to like bind to the target or inhibit the target. And you start from protein design, or you can start, you can just do protein selection, high throughput protein selection, which involves protein evolution. You just do the evolution using different systems to come up with the lead molecules, right? Oftentimes, the things you have in the beginning, like the things you design or the first thing you evolved, it's not, it's not the perfect one. Maybe the selectivity is not that high, which will give you side effects, or maybe it's not stable enough. So that will require further engineering. And then the chemistry can come together, come along. So the chemistry that we are working on can help you to make the protein molecule more stable, more selective. It's just a combination of these, all these things. And hopefully, in the end, you come with this lead molecule that's like selective, potent, and that's it. So what would it look like if we were behind the screen right now and you were Mm -hmm. showing us how 
you use uh, computer <clears throat> design to make yeah. proteins. Yeah, yeah. So to design, I mean, it's called structurally based design. If you have the structure of the target protein, right? Oftentimes you figure out the active site, like the surface, which part of the protein surface, like, like, like mm -hmm. us, yeah. like this part works on, or your arm works yeah. on what? Maybe you figure out the arm of the protein and then that's the function part. And then you see the shape of that. You try to come up with complement mm -hmm. surfaces, like my hands. Mm -hmm. It wraps around this here, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to come up with a structure that has the hand shape yeah. to bind to here. And then you can hold your arm. Oh, okay. So we use, we, we, maybe we come up with the finger, 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 different fingers. We have a palm and they roughly place them there, right? Wow. And then you use the computational approaches to just to stitch these different things together. Yeah. And then they hold up together. Eventually you did that hand and they grab there. They don't let go. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that wow. computationally, that's the basic concept. Is, is there a, is there parts on the surface of proteins that are harder to design for sure than others? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So traditionally for small molecule drug discovery, they have to, they require the protein surface to have a pocket. Pocket means like, I don't know, like you have a dent, oh, in just the, a pocket like right here, in like here, in the short, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the small can go in there. It go in there. If it goes in there, it has a better chance to fit in there, uh -huh. and then don't don't let go. But now, like for many many more targets we identify today, it's just like here. It's flat. It's a flat surface. Huh. So the small molecule it doesn't have enough of a surface area to yeah. interact, so it doesn't bind. Yeah. So you can't come up with therapeutics with small molecules. But with proteins, because you can design these things like have a really big surface area. Oh. So each part of the interaction might be weak. But if you integrate all these things together, together. it becomes really strong. It will bind. It will bind. And uh, previously, we were trying to get molecules to bind. And if it was a region that didn't really have that dent or yeah. that area for it to go to, plus it has to be so precisely targeted that it goes to that exact dent, yeah. that area. So, yeah. so do, do proteins kind of have like a more rugged, like? It could have different shapes. It can be smooth, it can be it can rugged. Be smooth, it can be really smooth. It can be rugged. It, some of them can have like pocket because they bind the different things to function. If they have a pocket, you can just go to the pocket and then you keep the protein activity. But other times, it's just the surface. Yeah. There's no pocket. How do you, how do you, yeah, how do you, yeah. how do you, how do you work on that? Yeah, yeah. You just have to have like big protein molecules like antibodies and to do that. Okay, okay. Oh, antibodies are big protein molecules. Huge, huge, huge. 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 Antibodies are huge. Huge, yeah. Like how many times bigger than the protein? Well, antibody, uh let's see antibody has roughly 1000 and uh maybe 1200 or between 1200 amino acids to 1, uh, 1500 okay. 1200 to 1500 a small molecule maybe just a few amino acids size oh. so it's a hundred times bigger whoa oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and around the size of our biggest proteins <clears throat> No. Uh, well, protein, there are bigger ones. We have like 5,000 amino acid proteins? Yeah, there are some of those. But some of, some of those, yeah. they are not just individual proteins. They form complex to work. Yeah. But antibodies are pretty big. Antibodies are not just a single chain either. It, it has different components. Different component chains, yeah. yeah, that yeah, together. yeah. And um, the antibodies role within our body is immune system. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's to identify pathologies. Yeah. As they're bind okay. to those. And bind to the oh bind to the pathologies. Yeah, so they so they, they, they cannot trigger any like inflammation or like immune response or whatever. Oh yeah. yeah. And antibodies originate from what part of our body? B cells. 
T cells? B, B cells. B cells. B cells. So T cells go and hunt for the. Right. And it's, B. Uh -huh, it's, and B it's, cells. It's a little bit complicated. Like you have, if you have antigen, right? I'm not an immunologist, if so, I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to say too much. Yeah, yeah, just even a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So like, like what well, antigen got inside the body? Like they're like the ready cells. Like they, they just uh, they just uh, swallow these antigens and then they prevent these cells on the surface of these dendritic cells. Yeah. And the T cells will interact with uh, dendritic cell and then maybe they can get activated. B cell will be involved too during the process. Launching uh, antibodies. <clears throat> but eventually the B cells will secrete the antibodies. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. What an incredible machinery the body is. Okay, and then. Let's talk about, um, like, is there one software that is the best for protein design right now? Yeah, there's one. It's, uh, it's called Rosetta from Rosetta. David Baker Lab at uh, University of Washington. This is your advisor? Your, no, no. It's, he no, wasn't I'd, your advisor. We collaborated. We, well, the, the work I talked about, we, we collaborated with him. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Rosetta has been really powerful. Rosetta is the best by far right now of... Well, I mean, it's the most popular one. It's the most popular. It's the most popular yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, is it kind of like Legos? Like, it's kind of like click and drag little little amino it's acids? A, it's a, well, it's a little bit com it's, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Cause the I know it's not yeah. like a five-year-old <laughs> playing Legos on the table. Yeah, yeah, there are there are, there are just different pieces. There are, I mean, like like I said, we want to design protein, right? You have like these fingers, the palm. You have this component. You you need to have some component to start with. Yeah. And then you can try to see how to place these components. Yes, yes. And then eventually, how you want, what kind of shape you want to make. Yes, yes. So based on that, you try to collect them and then. Maybe you have other things to, to, to make sure they go to this ship. But then like for the software, it's like, it's different modules, just try to use different modules. Okay, so this modular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah people don't need to write all the codes for that. Everything. You just need to yeah, learn to yeah. use the modules. So it's a little bit like click and drag in that sense, but then you still have to shape yeah. it the exact way you yeah, want it. Yeah. All yeah, you that you always stuff. need to see what the, the, the outcome of that, right? You have a design. You you run the you need to run simulations. Yeah. And then you see you you can see the result of the simulation, and then if that makes sense. Okay, so you've imaged the target protein, and you know where you want your uh, your um, computer designed protein to go and target that specific area on mm -hmm. the target protein, mm -hmm. and then you design via the com computer software the protein you can right and then you then you basically run the simulation of did it work no it didn't work okay you can simulate that and then you go okay let's adjust it like this way and yeah. then it's like did it work yeah ah it worked better yeah and then uh, so is it literally like that it's Crap. like that yeah you just keep tweaking this you have to go you can't do a, well i mean oftentimes you need to do a few rounds yeah. I mean, each single time, it's not just one output. You have thousands of like tens of thousands of outputs. You just need to, you have to come up with strategies to rank different things and then evaluate the results. So, yeah. You, I'm making such an interesting connection right now from another um, simulation software it's used in engineering okay. like in manufacturing yeah they have like a specific part in like a car or a plane or whatever and they 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 designate like the parameters mm -hmm. that it needs to um, that it needs to be able to hold a certain amount of force all this kind of stuff it's made of a certain material right yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the engineering simulation will go through just billions of permutations so fast and come up with the best possible solution for that limited space. I think it's uh, comparable. Yeah, I think it's comparable because when we design, we actually, I mean, we roughly know these modules, right? We don't, we, in the beginning, we, we don't name it, we don't, 
We are not sure which amino acid, which specific amino acid to put on there. So we are trying to go through this whole process to see which amino acid fits best, what's the best choice at this spot, at that sequence, and then how to make these connections. So you have to go through all the possibilities to, to, to eventually like, make this work. It's so <coughs> fascinating thinking about being able to leverage really powerful biotech simulation to find the most optimal uh, chemical protein synthesis that gives you the exact function that you want it to do within a therapeutic effect on the body. Yeah. Um, like yeah. To, I mean, like, yeah. you design that, then you design that, you probably, you're, you might need to evolve that too. And you, also, you can also synthesize that and engineer that too. But it's, it's all complementary. So it's, it's just a complementary approach that like might help another. And then, so part of the biosimulation is that you make the ideally chemically synthesized protein and that it ideally targets the exact location it's supposed to in the body. So like you have to run the biosimulation on that part and then you have to, if you could, it would be ideal that I could literally run you. I have, would have your exact yeah. you know, tens of trillions of cells of your body put together, you know, into this is, you know, a digital twin of Bobo Dung and then I can deploy my chemically synthesized protein into your body and see yeah. digitally, right, on the digital twin version before we do it on the physical version and then see if it does the exact therapeutic effect that we want it to do. And we can run that billions of times to make sure it's safe or fast forward 20 years, yeah. see if anything bad has happened, you know? Sci yeah. That's like science fantasy. Yeah. yeah. Science fiction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, can, if you can do the simulation at the cell level, I'd be so amazing, so amazing. Yes. Cause it's it's just so complicated. Cause like when you do simulations, or like or designs, you have to consider every single atom, the movement of every single atom. Yeah. Like think about how many atoms are there are in, in one, one cell, protein molecule. In one protein, one protein molecule. molecule. Like think about how many proteins in one cell. <sighs> and it's not just the proteins; there are other things too. Yeah. Yeah. But people can simulate that. It's so funny looking so back a hundred years, blowing. like it, in a hundred years, yeah. if you look back at this video content yeah, yeah, and yeah. you go look at them talking about how hard it was to make a simulation <laughs> of a cell. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. If, you, if you think about that, like a hundred years ago when people start to make peptides, yeah. even make like peptide like four or five amino acids long, hundred years ago, it's not possible. <laughs> like maybe 60, 70 years ago, it takes so much effort. Like the first, uh, first uh, chemically synthesized insulin, that was made roughly 50, 60 years ago. That took maybe 100 people, like five, wow. five years, or maybe even longer to and make now, that. And now we brew and now, insulin, <clears throat> just... Now myself, if I want to make that, I can make that in like one or two, one, two weeks. Just me, myself. Just you by yourself can make insulin. One yeah. or two weeks. In one or two weeks. Yeah. 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 Exactly. About, the home brewed insulin market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the insulin in the market, it's, it's already commonly expressed. It's not chemically synthesized. It's not chemically. It's not chemically synthesized. Because insulin is actually a little bit, a little bit tricky. It has two different chains. The two different chains have like, they, they, they need to be linked correctly together yeah. to function. Yeah. So, I mean, for the production cost view, I think it's actually, it, people are doing that recombinantly. Because yeah. insulin is like, it's one part of the like, hu human. So they can, they can express that pretty efficiently. <clears throat> I love the points about like both democratizing chemical protein synthesis so that we can let people be creative and use their creative talents and try and solve these big health um, challenges. Uh, but also ethically evolving and consciously, spiritually evolving so that 
we don't put chemical protein synthesis into the hands of people that can cause bad yeah. protein synthesis. Yeah, that could, that, that. That actually, that actually could happen if people want to do that. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah, yeah, because it's. I mean, the technology. It's not. If you want to something, if you want to make something bad, it's it's not that hard. Yeah. Yeah. You said you could make insulin in one to two weeks. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it used to take a team hundred people and. You know all this stuff before, and so like, yeah. look at how much faster it's going down and down and down and yeah, yeah. 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 I'm just gonna be able to download the the bad thing from the internet in the future and just have it be made by a yeah. robot. You know. Yeah, I mean, whatever. the society needs to have just needs to have regulations on these things. Like, I mean, we can't control the individual behaviors of every human being, but then like, we have regulations, we have laws. People follow the rules. If you don't, then you get punished. But yeah. uh, it's, I mean, you can't, you can't just, somebody can actually take these technologies to do something, but. Uh, I like to think about it like needing to evolve ourselves consciously faster so that we don't have those oops moments and then we don't need these extremely strict regulations and laws also that, yeah, that sometimes can hinder um, yeah. creativity. Or maybe people just need to educate Education is a yeah. big part of it. Is yeah. a big, big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do a couple quick questions on the way out that we like asking our guests. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the overall meaning or purpose of life? Hmm. Overall meaning of life. <clears throat> I think it's about explore the unknown territory in every aspect. Could be in science, could be in nature, could be like consciousness, like people want to know what's the basis of memory, what's the basis of consciousness. I think I think the meaning of life is just is to understand these things and then maybe know where, where 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 we come from. It's hard to figure out where we're going. Cause but uh, figuring out where we come from, maybe it helps. Learn from the learn from the past. But it's it's it's. I think it's all about exploration. Like you need to have the people need to have the spirit to go out and do things. And they need to they actually need to believe in the things that they might be able to do. I mean, you may not necessarily be able to do that in your lifetime, but I think it's actually important to have the belief that you can do something, you can achieve something through this life. I think that's that's actually key. I like, I mean, I'm a big fan for rock climbing. I rock climb a lot. Like, the spirit is it's it's the same. Like, you have to go explore and then explore the limits of yourself. Maybe that will partially explore the limits of the human race. I think for people, if people all have this mindset and then. It will be the life will. I mean, the society will be more diverse. Like, and we need to love these these behaviors. People need to support each other on this. So, I me mean myself, like, I, I I just like this spirit. So uh, I'm heading toward that. Yeah, pushing the boundaries of what is known, pushing the edge of knowledge further yeah. and further, going into the unknown, venturing out there. Yeah. Life become more interesting if you do that. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so boring. Yeah, yeah. It could be really boring for life. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What about a skill that young people should know going into the exponential technology age? The skill. It's hard to see the one single specific skill. I think more, maybe. It's more about your mindset. You have to you have to cope. You have to keep your mind open. Like things are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. You know you can't just rely on that. You can, you acquire this single skill and then you can just uh, you can just like uh, you can just go out and then like do everything. It's not possible. You just 
you, you need to keep the mind open and then see what's happening in the world and then see maybe how you can contribute to this world by doing the things that you can do or maybe pushing it further to explore the things you haven't thought about yeah. so I think the mindset is actually more important than the skills and <clears throat> How can we inspire more people around our world to collaborate? Yeah, I like collaboration for myself. I just like to work with people. <coughs> and especially you feel happy when you work with people and then make things work. How to educate? I mean, it's a long process. Like maybe the, the whole society needs to make the effort in there. Like like through schools and then through the working with people I just think people need to be more open and then eventually if the openness will, will, will lead to trust in people then I think that will, that will definitely help with that but like how to, how to get people more open it's, 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 it's like a society behavior like I mean, people just need to tolerate other people, support, uh, support people. So if you do, I mean, if you see things differently, I like, the, like the, the things in the US, don't judge, right? So you have to keep your mind open, then we need to share with people, share the knowledge, share the skills, educate other people. And if everybody makes a little bit effort on their end, I think eventually people will have more trust in each other and then maybe collaborate together yeah I, I think that's my thought yeah. yeah what do you think is the role of love in our world <laughs> it's critical apparently yeah I mean human I mean not just human all life forms it, essentially eventually it's reproduction that's like I mean that's the driving force if there's no reproduction there's no driving force for the for the society for, for, for human or for life form. So love is, love could be like love is just like I mean reproduction is a direct result from from love. I mean love can mean other things too. Like love can mean like just like you go out on the street, like talk to people, like encourage people, encourage people to explore the unknown words. It encourage people to do the things they can't do or maybe encourage people like they have difficulties in their life so it's critical people need to have love for, for yourself for other people for the world do you think that this is a simulation I think about that actually sometimes like you go back home, right? How can you tell, like, how can I tell the things that the world we are living in is not, is not a dream, right? I mean, we feel everything, right? We talk to people, the things different. But then, I mean, it could be a dream. When you dream, I mean, when, you, when you're living your dream, it's like the same. You, feel, you don't know you're dreaming, right? Sometimes you wake up and then you feel, you feel, oh, I was dreaming. But maybe this whole thing is a dream. It could be. But it doesn't matter, right? Whether it's dreaming or not. You still do the things you want to do. You still explore the things you want to explore. You still try to push the people you want to push, educate the people you want to, you want to educate and then love the people you want to love. So I think it doesn't matter. And what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world I feel it's like I feel like the people have the spirit to do the things that they were not sure if they can do and sometimes they, they, they are actually willing to sacrifice for that I don't know why people want to do that but people can do that and there are people doing that I think that's so incredible you can't explain right I, I mean if you want to if you want to if you want to live if you want to live 
just just keep you, keep you alive. There are so many ways, and then it's also a basic instinct to keep yourself alive. But then there are so many people trying to push the boundaries, and then sometimes it costs it costs the life even. But then people still have the spirit to do that. I don't. I mean, it's hard to explain. But that thing, I think that thing actually makes you feel your life is fulfilling. You are achieving. You are you you are you are, you are not proving to you are not proved you are proving to other people that you're worth it. It's just like it's just a matter of yourself. Like I want to do that, and I feel happy doing that. So that's the that's the reason I want to do that, and I will do that. And I think that's the thing. Yes. Yeah. We really love calling it like the burden of genius. That you take on this amount of responsibility, and you just go and bring this unique gift to the world, and it's just such a gorgeous feeling and experience to go through that journey and to bring mm -hmm. value to yeah. others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you may not know clearly you're bring you're creating some value, but you are. Yeah. So people need to do that. Yeah. And encourage others. Encourage others, yes, yes, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But yeah. Well, this has been such a pleasure. Okay. Thank you so Still much talking for coming with you, on yeah. our show. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for all your great work. Yeah. Good Thanks. job. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about protein technologies about protein engineering, about chemical synthesis, and about how this can be therapeutic for our lives, how we can unlock biology, and on the simulation side as well. Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in, help them grow. You can find all of Bobo and his labs linked below, you can find Westlake's links below, you can reach out to them and join them in their efforts if you'd like and collaborate. You can find our links below to our show. You can support us and help us grow, help us continue doing cool things like coming to Hangzhou and doing interviews at Westlake with brilliant people. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Good job, my man. Good, Good talk. Job.